Okay, so let's start. Uh, we now have enough people to uh, join this uh, uh, new edition of the uh, online webinar of Le Lab Quantique. Uh, today we're going to talk uh, with uh, three amazing panelists about uh, superconducting qubits, quantum machine learning, and uh, the uh, quantum communication market. Uh, I'll just start to share my slide. <clears throat> Oh, here it is. So, so Le Lab Quantique, we're an association founded uh, this year. We uh, are composed of four people. So there is myself, who am I? Uh, I'm the vice president. Christophe Jurzac, uh, who is the president. Robert Marino, treasurer. And Jean-Christophe Goujon, um, general secretary. So we were funded this year. We gather uh, more than a thousand people in the meetup group. We organize uh, often uh, webinars, and previously we, organized, uh, we were organizing physical events all around quantum technologies. We are uh, supported by Quantum Nation, the first VC fund dedicated to quantum technology, and BPI France, uh, the French sovereign uh, fund, aiming at. Uh, fostering the ecosystem around deep technologies, and now uh, through the Lab Quantique, also quantum technologies. Uh, we also organized uh, hackathons on uh, quantum computing, which was hosted by Quantum Nation. And uh, we co-organized with BPI France uh, some events, especially a yearly event called uh, Quantum Computing for Business, to which uh, Jordanis has already uh, participated uh, last year. Um, Okay, so uh, we are uh, we have a website, a YouTube channel, and the Meetup group. All the links are here. Uh, we share uh, all the um, slides that are presented during the session just after uh, to uh, the people that attended attended the, the meeting. We also live podcast on YouTube. The replay is available on our website, and uh, now we try to share some. Uh, interesting topics, articles on the website, some thought leadership. Uh, so do not hesitate to follow us and uh, consult uh, uh, as, uh, as often as possible uh, our website. We have also created a medium. Thanks to Marc Kaplan from VeryCloud, we now have our first article on how to build quantum communication network at small scale. VeryCloud is a French startup. Um, providing protocols for uh, quantum communications uh, led by Marc Kaplan. Uh, do not hesitate to reach us. Uh, also, Christophe uh, will, share, will, to, will share his mail address and reach us if you have uh, any will to collaborate with us on any specific topics and uh, some expertise in the field that we could relay on uh, our Medium channel. We also uh, post job posts on our website. We now have more than 10 offers currently pending. So I just listed them on the slide. Uh, these are from leading quantum startups, uh, C12, C12, QNAMI, Pascal, Alice and Bob, and Cordela. Congratulations also to Alice and Bob, who just uh, raised the 3 million round uh, just later, uh, just the, the week before. So today, we're going to speak about three topics with uh, three quantum experts. Uh, first, first of all, will be Alexandre Blais, who's a professor at the University of Sherbrooke. He had a numerous prize and was one of the pioneers in uh, superconducting qubits architecture, so the Transmo. Uh, he was awarded a lot of prize and is also in charge of a research group at the University of Sherbrooke. Then uh, Yornadis uh, Kerenidis from QCWare is, uh, is going to talk about quantum machine learning. He's a lead, uh, he's a senior researcher at CNRS and also head of uh, quantum algorithm uh, at QCWare, a uh, quantum startup pioneering the field of the application of the quantum uh, computer. And uh, lastly, Jean-Christophe Eloy from uh, Yol Development is a founder and CEO of your development, a consulting firm focusing on deep technologies. And they just unveiled a study about quantum technologies. 
and uh, with an overview of the market, it will more specially focus on the quantum communication market uh, with a really deep um, deep analysis of uh, all uh, the ins and outs of the in and outs of uh, this market. For this webinar, uh, rules are pretty simple. Um, attendees cannot broadcast their video. Uh, so I'm sorry, but you won't see anything from coming. Uh, you won't be able to see the attendees. If there is anything that is uh, going uh, bad, just tell us in the chat if uh, you cannot hear anything. If you have any question, there is a Q&A block just at the bottom of the screen and uh, attendees, uh, speakers will be uh, happy to answer all the questions after the presentation. If we have uh, uh, enough time, we'll try to uh, live to answer live to some questions. Um, do not be afraid to reach us, uh, Christophe or me, if there is something you want to know. Uh, we always um, we always download the chat and uh, all the q a so we have a, a file that is gathering uh, everything was said during the, the meetup so i think it's time for alexandre to uh, introduce us to uh, uh, superconducting qubits oh, i just stopped sharing my screen your turn hello uh Hello everyone, thank you for the introduction. Thank you for the, to the Lab Quantic for the uh, invitation to speak at this event. This is great that you're organizing uh, this to bring the, the community together, especially at this time. So I think I'll start to share my screen now. So you should see my presentation. So today indeed I'm going to talk about supernating uh, qubits. And uh, so this is, uh, uh, I'm currently at the Institute of Quantic at the University of Sherbrooke. And although I won't be really talking about the work which uh, has been, uh, has been uh, going on in my group, but rather focus on the, 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 the state of the art and the challenges of the field, I still want to uh, mention the amazing team, team working uh, on swing quantum circuits, in particular circuit QED uh, in Sherbrooke. So in the last few years, we're hearing more and more about quantum computation, quantum computers. And, if maybe a question uh, a few years ago was, well, whether it would be at all possible to have a, a quantum computer one day, it seems that the question has shifted now to when and how uh, will uh, the first quantum computers appear, arrive? And, and maybe you found yourself asking this question, maybe like which uh, quantum computer might be right uh, for you? So, well, if you're asking this question, uh, uh, you're lucky because a few years ago, the new scientist, uh, in fact, published what they call the first buyer's guide to the uh, uh, to quantum computing. So, although we shouldn't take this too seriously, I think there is a, a few interesting uh, indications there. First, we see several technologies that are compared. A few of them uh, being studied in Shabok at the Institute Quantic, in particular, superconducting qubits, spin qubits, and topological qubits. And these different architectures are. Uh, compare the, uh, according to uh, several criterions. For example, how many map apps are running on these, uh, uh, on these uh, com uh, the prototype quantum computers or eventual quantum computers? I wasn't aware that we had an app store for quantum apps, but that's good. There are other uh, criteria such as upgradability and quantumness, which frankly, I don't quite understand what they mean, but that doesn't really matter because as any uh, bias guide like this, we always go to uh, uh, the, the end of the table and look at the uh, numbers of thumbs up, like right? what, what is the, the ultimate uh, say there. And what we see, maybe not surprisingly, although again, we shouldn't take this too seriously, is that superintending qubits have a number of, larger number of thumbs up. And again, in this talk, what I want to do is to uh, explain uh, how this come about and what is the state of the art and like, what, are, uh, what are some of the challenges. So let's take a step back first and ask, uh, what, uh, what do we need from a, a quantum system to be a quantum information system, a quantum information processor to be a, a quantum computer? What is the challenge here? Well, first, as you all know, we need qubits. We need two-level system, which are isolated quantum systems that have well-defined energy levels that we call zero and one, in which we can uh, encode quantum information, manipulate quantum information. So these systems have to be very well isolated from any 
environmental pertur perturbations to make sure that the quantum effects are long lived. Other word, in other words, uh, that there are few errors in the, during the computation. Uh, moreover, we need, of course, many of these qubits, and these uh, qubits uh, should be controllable. We need to be able to uh, uh, control the internal state of these qubits. Of course, these qubits need to be able to talk to each, uh, to each other, to interact in some way, to be able to do meaningful algorithms. And in the context of quantum information, we call this entanglement. We need to generate entanglement between the different qubits. And if the computation is to be useful at the end, we of course need to read the, the qubits out. We need to uh, uh, find if they are in the state zero or one. And all of these manipulations, single qubit gates, entangling gates, and readout should be fast enough, uh, fast, in, at least faster than the lifetime of the quantum effects in these, in these systems uh, uh, for the answer to mean anything. Uh, well, that already uh, points out uh, to a major challenge here. So, because clearly what we're asking for, from these different components are conflicting, to an extent, conflicting requirements. On the one end, we want our qubits to be very isolated. We want the qubits to uh, uh, be hidden from any uh, 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 noise, any uh, external perturbation. At the same time, we want these qubits to be strongly coupled to the external world to make sure that it is possible to control them as fast as possible, right? So we want them to be strongly isolated uh, and nevertheless be well connected to outside electronics. And so satisfying these two uh, criteria, these two conflicting requirements together is why is one of the reasons why uh, uh, building a quantum processor is such a difficult thing. But from the point of view of a physicist, why this is such an interesting uh, uh, project, why this is a, such an interesting field to be working on. So specifically for supercomputing quantum processors, are we uh, addressing these challenges? Well, um, we are uh, um, using what I called transmon qubits, which I will present here again as two-level systems. But in a few slides, I'll show a few a uh, bit more information about how this is actually how these qubits actually look like. But at the moment, let's take them as two-level systems uh, that we can control using now uh, voltage sources uh, uh, oscillating at microwave frequencies. The transition frequency zero one between these qubits is in the microwave frequency range, a few gigahertz. And so if you apply said microwave pulses at that appropriate frequency, you're able to uh, bring, for example, the state zero to state one, the information from state zero to state one, and this way control the internal state of this qubit, manipulate the quantum information. The second crucial aspect in a supercomputing quantum information processor are microwave cavities, which are represented here by these two mirrors that are facing each other. Uh, and that cavity plays two major roles. First, uh, by embedding several qubits, one or several qubits inside this cavity, you can shine, again, microwave uh, voltages, microwave light at the input port of the cavity and collect the transmitted signal. And what that does for you is that because of the interaction of the microwave field as it propagates through the cavity, the microwave photon, the microwave field, carries information about the state of the qubit, which you can infer by measuring these photons at the output port of the cavity. So the first role of these microwave cavities in supercomputing quantum impression processor is to allow for qubit readout. The second is that if you've prepared an interesting state, say of your first qubit here, you can transfer that state to the cavity as a microwave photon, which is captured uh, 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 which is forced uh, to stay close to, these, to the qubits because of the presence of the cavity. So this microwave photon will be a long-lived photon in proximity to these, to these qubits. And you can arrange for this microwave photon to be absorbed by a, a second qubit, which importantly does not have to be a nearest neighbor. It can be any other qubit uh, embedded in the same cavity. And in this way, what you've accomplished is that you have mediated uh, uh, interactions mediated entanglement between two qubits which can be far apart, as far as a centimeter, for example. And so this is why we call this microwave cavity sometimes a quantum bus. So this is this package is known as circuit QED, where we have supercomputing transmont qubits interacting again with microwave cavities for qubit readout 
and the mediation of qubit qubit entanglement. So this is one variation of uh, uh, what a quantum information uh, processor with orienting circuit looks like. If you're looking, for example, at what the, the Google approach, uh, for example, they use very similar setups. Uh, again, transmon uh, qubits and cavities. But in their particular implementations, while the cavities are used for qubit readouts, they are in fact not used to mediate uh, quantum information between the different qubits. Here, uh, uh, another widget is used to mediate interaction between the only neighboring uh, qubits, and that widget is in fact another transmon qubit distinction. So there's different approaches, uh, uh, but all essentially using the same ingredients. But this, uh, to me, at least this is a, a, one of the reasons why this field is so interesting and so rich is that because we have a lot of flexibility in, in engineering and designing the, the circuits uh, that we want for our particular applications. And so this is why you see so many different uh, types of superintendent quantum processors being studied in different uh, um, academic labs and companies now. Okay. So let's look a little bit more closely at what these qubits uh, look like. So what you're seeing here is a chip which was uh, provided by one of my friends, uh, Andreas Walraff uh, at the ETH Zurich. So this is a chip that I always carry with me, in fact, giving uh, talks like this, but uh, and I can uh, uh, make sure that the audience can have a look at it and, and play a little bit with it. But today, a picture will have to do. So what you're seeing in this chip is in the center here, what you're seeing is a, a sapphire substrate on which aluminum, a tin film of aluminum has been evaporated. On the uh, ridge here, on the, uh, uh, on the periphery of the circle of the chip, what you're seeing are uh, coax cable connectors, essentially, which we'll use in a second to send microwave pulses down to the qubits. So talking about qubits, if you zoom in on one corner of that chip, what you see is an object which looks like this. Here, what you're seeing in black is the sapphire substrate. Everything else is the aluminum film. White is the transmine qubit. Uh, pinkish are ground planes. So just, uh, just metal that is sitting there for the moment. So the transmine qubit, as you can see, is a pretty large object, something like 300 microns uh, of width. So this is pretty large. And it's made of two uh, aluminum islands here, which are facing each other. So for those who know a little bit about electrical circuits, that looks like a capacitor two plates of a capacitor. But these two plates of the capacitor are connected through this thin skinny wire here, uh, which uh, for those who know a little bit again about circuits, looks like an inductor. So this is very much like a, 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 an LC circuit uh, from microwave engineering. However, uh, this is a little bit more than that because if you look here, zoom in, and now you see we've changed scale dramatically from centimeters to microns to nanometers. So now this is a picture which is taken from an extra micrograph. And what you see is a Josephson junction, which is interrupting this little wiring. And that junction is crucial here. All of the field relies on this strange looking object, uh, which is essentially a, a, a nonlinear circuit element. This is the only known nonlinear, non-dissipative circuit elements, which allows us to uh, create interesting quantum states in these microwave uh, superconducting devices. So this is really a crucial object. And so let's look again at the transmon. So the transmon has two islands. And on these islands, there are electrons. Or in fact, because we're dealing with the superconducting systems, we rather think about pairs of electrons, what we call Cooper pairs. And so we can have one of these Cooper pairs sitting on one of this island, and it can travel, uh, and this we will call zero. Okay, so Cooper pair up, I call this zero. And that Cooper pair can travel down this little wire uh, uh, to eventually arrive at the second island. And this I'll call one. And these are roughly speaking, the two states that we're using in a transform qubit. Roughly speaking, uh, Cooper pair up is zero, Cooper pair down is one. And because this is a, a quantum mechanical circuit, a me quantum mechanical a system, we can prepare superposition of these two states, could prepare up and could prepare down at the same time. So we can, we can prepare these superpositions. We can prepare these superpositions and they can live for a long time, uh, 100 or more microseconds now. And you can, importantly, also control the, the state of this uh, qubit by applying, as I said, pulses. You can apply 
a microwave pulse, for example, to one of these uh, 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 connectors. And that will apply a voltage in proximity to the qubit, which will cause a qubit rotation, for example, going from 0 to 1 or 0 to 0 plus 1. A different pulse will allow you to change, for example, the phase. And that's a little bit more subtle, but you can change the phase of this superposition to 0 minus 1. And then a different pulse will allow, as I mentioned before, to read out the state of the qubit. And now my, OK. Oh, you still see this, my processor was lagging a little bit. And so by applying a different pulse, now you can uh, uh, connect uh, 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 the field coming out of this, uh, uh, of this segment of microwave KVT that we're seeing here. Uh, and that infers, that tells you something about the state of the qubit. So again, if you look at this old chip, there is room for more than one qubit. And so there is, in fact, four qubits on this particular chip. It's a bit of an old uh, chip. By now, several tens of qubits are routinely built and operated. And so uh, again, you have uh, two of these transmons, uh, uh, four in fact, but I'm showing only two, which are separated and connected again by these transmission line resonators, which are the realization of these microwave cavities that I talked about before. So this is really the cavity that I talked about, which looks like this in practice. And by applying the appropriate pulses, you can again uh, 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 enact a two qubit gate, or if you want to, you can entangle these two qubits. And what is pretty interesting is that now you can prepare entangled states of two macroscopic quantum circuits separated by a macroscopic uh, 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 distance, by a centimeter or more. So really this exploration of these superconducting quantum circuits is interesting for quantum information processing for sure. But it's also opening a new door to quantum effects. Quantum effects are certainly no longer restricted to small uh, 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 macroscopic systems. We're talking about macroscopic uh, scales here where we can prepare the strangest of all strangest uh, quantum uh, states, entangled states. And so by pushing these ideas uh, further, companies like IBM uh, have been able to create more complex chips. So this is one of their uh, uh, chips from a few years back where you see 16 transmons, 22 resonators that are used to couple these transmons together, and 16 more of these trans resonators that are used to read out and control the state of the transmons. And so all of that is giving you an architecture which looks like this, where you have a ladder of qubits, the dots being the, the qubits, and the white aligns the interaction between the different qubits. So that gives you a processor with a topology looking like this. Other companies are uh, also uh, creating complex chips. So this is a chip from uh, uh, Rigetti from a few years ago, where you see, in fact, uh, 20 transmons. Uh, the transmons look a little bit funny here. They have these this circle shape, Mickey Mouse type uh, shape. But nevertheless, these are uh, transmons uh, that operate very much in the same way uh, uh, from, from, from any other transmon that, that I've mentioned before. Again, this is part of the flexibility that we have with these superconducting super circuits. We can design and shape these uh, objects uh, to suit our purposes, and they still behave as, 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 as very good superconducting quantum circuits. And here you see, again, the readout resonators. And between these different uh, qubits, you see the, the, the transmission lines that are used to, the cavities that are used to couple the qubits. So this particular chip had uh, 20 qubits, but I think in practice only uh, 19 was working. And of course, you've probably all you heard about the Google uh, efforts. Uh, in their case, they often show us uh, chips that look like this. So this looks very professional. It looks like a package uh, uh, chip. It's interesting to point out that what we're seeing, in fact, is the back of, of their chip. So they're using an interesting approach, which is used by different groups, uh, in particular at MIT, for example, the group of Willow Lever, where you have two chips, one chip which has the qubits and the control uh, resonators. And on the second chip, you have the, the measurement resonators. And these two chips are glued essentially uh, together. And so what you're seeing really is the, the back end of one of these chips. And so all of the quantum action is happening here in the middle of, of, this, uh, of this sandwich. OK, and so uh, so again, this, this idea is being pursued by uh, companies, but also by academic uh, groups. Uh, talking about the industrial efforts, 
uh, you've, uh, I'm sure you have heard about the quantum, uh, IBM quantum experience where you can go online and program some of these uh, processors. So this is the 53 qubit from zero to 52. So this is the 53 uh, uh, qubit processor circles are the transplant qubits and the arrows are the coupling resonators. So you see again an interesting topology. Uh, at these particular processors, for example, this one, which is known as the Rochester uh, qubit, you can, uh, if you're part of these uh, quantum hubs, you can uh, go online and start programming and playing uh, uh, with, these, uh, with these online processors. Uh, so that really is a testament to the evolution of the field. In a sense, what we have now are very robust superconducting quantum circuits that uh, uh, non-experts can start uh, to play and use not quite yet as a quantum processor, but at least as a, a prototype where some of the early ideas can be tested and explored. So I think this is uh, a very, uh, use, very useful development for the field. You will also have heard about the, the supremacy experiment uh, from Google, where they used, uh, 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 again, 53 qubits. So they had a plaquette of 54. Uh, uh, one of them was not uh, working. So 53 of these qubits were used to, uh, uh, for their supremacy experiment. And this particular experiment in the Google uh, case, uh, they use transmons that are not two places of metal facing each other or, or look like a sphere, but rather they use these X type uh, uh, transmons. Uh, but these really are the same objects. And between these transmons, you see uh, coupling elements, again, different transmons which allow for nearest neighbor uh, qubits to interact, uh, 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 to interact and, and get entangled. And by operating and, and measuring this complex uh, chip, they were able to um, create interesting states that would have been very difficult to produce uh, even by the largest uh, supercomputers. Okay, but uh, now that uh, this is really the state of the art uh, where in since uh, the late uh, uh, 90s, uh, early 2000, where we saw the very first experiments on certain quantum circuits um, with at the time very poor coherence times, what we saw was a uh, massive progression in the field of, of more and more players, both academic and, and industry, uh, investing in this uh, direction. Uh, culminating to this type of experiment. But I think what the field is realizing now more and more is that uh, if we simply want to brute force scale what we have done so far, that is a difficult path forward. That's a possible path forward, but that is a difficult path forward. And uh, this is something which is acknowledged by everyone. And if you look at one of the last lines of the Google paper, what they, they, they will tell you is that, well, quantum error correction in fact, the, the acknowledgement and the dealing with the fact that qubits are prone to errors, uh, error quantum error correction needs to become the focus of attention of the field. And so let me say a few words about quantum error correction now, because this is really a crucial aspect of the field that we are only now starting to address uh, experimentally, although this is something which has a very strong theoretical uh, uh, background. Now what we're trying to do as a field is to bring this very uh, strong, large theoretical construction background and bring it uh, closer to experiments such that it, these ideas become more practical. So uh, the idea behind quantum error correction is first uh, the recognition that qubits are prone to errors. Errors will happen on these qubits and we need to keep track of these errors and correct these errors. Uh, error correction is used in our current supercomputers, uh, uh, but errors are very unlikely uh, 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 with, with classical transistors. This is very different with superconducting qubits and any qubits, in fact. And so what you do is just like in classical error correction, you use redundancy to protect information. So if I have one bit, which I care about very much, what I will do is I will take many, uh, um, many versions of that, I will, I don't want to use the word copy because some, some people here that know about the quantum uh, no cloning theorem uh, might think about that, but nevertheless, uh, I use different copies of the same uh, information, which uh, uh, if there was one error on one of these copies, well, that's fine because I can always look at the other copies to, re to recover the information. 
So this is very crudely, uh, very crude image for how quantum error correction works. But the main idea to understand is that to be able to have one error-free qubit, which we call a logical qubit, we now know that it might need several thousands of physical qubits. So we, need, we might need several thousands physical imperfect qubits to make one uh, uh, perfect logical qubits on which we can do quantum computation, fault tolerant read for long times, be able to do very complex computation, much more complex than we can do now. The problem uh, also is that the number of physical qubits, that number of a thousand, increases as the error rate or the, the probability of having an error, an error on our qubits uh, uh, increases. And so if you bring all of that together, you find that, for example, if you want to factor a 600-bit number using Shor's factoring algorithm, well, that will need something like a thousand logical qubits. But in practice, having these thousand uh, uh, logical qubits acting together coherently, falteringly, might require something between a, a million and a billion physical qubits. So that's quite daunting. Doesn't mean it's not possible to do it, but still, this is quite daunting. And so what we recognize now as a field is that we need two things. We need to avoid this, uh, this, this blow up of required resources. And there are two things that can help us. First, better physical qubits will make sure that the, uh, the, the number of physical qubits per logical qubits can uh, uh, be smaller. And second, better codes. We need to work on better quantum error correcting codes. And in the last few minutes, let me tell you about some of the efforts towards building better qubits and better codes. First, if we want to build better qubits, well, we need to uh, think about the transmont qubits. This is the, the current uh, uh, qubit which is used by uh, most groups. Uh, uh, why is it used by most groups? Well, because this is a qubit which has almost, uh, well, now uh, it was invented really in 2007, but ver uh, early versions, if you want, of the transmont qubits have been uh, in the operating in labs uh, for more than 20 years now. And what you see, especially if you put this on a log plot, is that we have a tremendous improvement of that qubit over the years. So what you see is the, if you don't under understand these numbers of T1 and T2, Roughly speaking, this is the time uh, between errors, if you want. That's the typical time between errors. So, so something like 100 or so microseconds. And so this is a time which has been increasing uh, steadily uh, uh, over the last 20 years. So relatively long coherence times. This qubit also almost always works, and it's quite simple. So if you build this qubit, if you build 50 of these qubits, they all work. Importantly, in the Google experiment that I mentioned, there was one qubit that didn't work. This was not due to the qubit not working. This was, in fact, some, some classical, so it was really some classical connection, uh, which was not uh, properly done on that qubit. So this is, was not the fault of the transmont qubit itself. So we need to, to, to build a, a qubit which is better than all of that, and that's challenging. And one thing that we've seen in the last few years in the field is that while initially there was in the early 2000s, there were several types of student qubits being explored simultaneously by different groups. What we've seen is that the field has really uh, focused on the transmon and that led to this tremendous improvement in the short and medium term. But maybe the, 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 the richness that we add as a field of exploring different possibilities, this is something that we've lost. That's a missed opportunity. But fortunately, we're seeing in the last few years, uh, uh, more and more people uh, explore the idea that the transmon might not be enough to build uh, a fault tolerant scalable quantum computers. And we see more and more qubits uh, uh, being explored. And you might have heard about fluxonions on zero pi and bosonic qubits. And these qubits are qubits that are more complex, but that have other advantages, in particular, they have much longer uh, uh, coherence and, and, and coherence times. Are we approaching the uh, close to the end of the? Uh, so I will. I won't have time to tell you more about the zero pi qubit, but I can tell you that this is work that we've been doing. Uh, we've been exploring, uh, in particular, with a student, my group, Agustin Di Paolo, and the group of Andrew Rauch in Princeton. 
we have been exploring this uh, zero pi qubit. And in the first experiment, we were able to find uh, zero pi qubits, which uh, showed uh, what we call T1 time. So the time it takes for an error to uh, occur of a bit flip from one to zero, which was not a hundred microseconds, but rather something like a millisecond, uh, 1.5 millisecond, in fact. So in this very first experiment, this is a good signal that these more exotic qubits have uh, a, 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 probably have a role to play in the future. Uh, I was now about to say one or two slides about better codes, but maybe this is time for me to wrap this up. So is, is that the case? Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. It just uh, you can conclude in a few minutes, of course. But uh... OK, so let me just say one last message, and then I will conclude. The message that I want to say is that, uh, um, yes, this idea of thinking about better quantum error correcting code. As I said, error correction has been studied for almost 20 years now, more than 20 years, in fact, with the first paper by Peter Shore in uh, about 95, 1995. And what is uh, uh, interesting to me is that if you look at the history of quantum error correction, no assumptions are made about the underlying hardware in these codes. Essentially, there's a group of researchers that are developing codes, but I don't know anything about the hardware on which these codes will be developed. And on the other end, there's a community of researchers, well, a little bit like me, that are developing the hardware, but I don't know much about quantum error correction. And what we're seeing is that this is really time for these two communities to work together. For example, what we're starting to understand is that if we exploit the error model, what, what error is likely, what error is unlikely to occur in your hardware, you can uh, design much more efficient quantum error correction codes. And so I won't have time to dwell on this, but this is what is known now as quantum, uh, as hardware efficient quantum error correction, where we're now realizing that rather than using a thousand qubits to uh, robustly encode quantum information, maybe only a few physical qubits uh, will do. And all of that is possible by really exploiting the structure of the errors in the hardware that we now understand very well. So with that, I will uh, jump immediately to my conclusion. So I think the main message that I want to tell is that I, I that I've convinced you that so I think quantum circuits are a promising platform for, uh, uh, for quantum computation. There are challenges. Uh, we need better qubits. We need uh, quantum error correction. But I think the field is in a very good shape to address uh, these challenges together. And in particular, I think this direction of hardware efficient quantum error correction is quite promising. So if you're interested uh, in, to learn more about circuit QD, sorry for the publicity, but I will mention two reviews that we have written on the topic. So if you want a short review, a few pages, there, is a, there was a, a focus issue on circuit QD in nature physics where we wrote uh, with Steve Gervin and Will Oliver a, a short review on quantum reflection processing and quantum optics in the system. And more recently with uh, Arne Grinspo, Steve Gervin, and Andreas Walraff, we wrote an 80 page review on circuit QED if you really want to go into the details of this architecture. And with that, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Alexandre. It was uh, really, uh, really, really interesting. We are very happy to uh, have you and have uh, uh, insights of uh, this boiling thing uh, of uh, superconducting qubits. Uh, you raised many points. Some uh, people asked uh, questions on the Q&A blog, so you could answer to them. And I wanted to thank you again uh, for your views, um, because uh, it's worth noting that uh, that was the architecture used by Google uh, and also Rigetti, who, which are all leading uh, quantum companies. So we have very, very interesting insight from, uh, the, I think, a world specialist on this topic. So thank you, Alexandre. Uh, we are going you. now to Jordanis, uh, which will explain how to leverage those qubits uh, and improving their performance to do some uh, concrete stuff, and especially for uh, quantum machine learning. Uh, floor is yours, Jordanis. Thank you, Jean Gabriel. Thank you, Christophe, for the. Thank you both for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, yeah, as you said, I will be talking more about uh, applications of quantum computing. 
this is something I have been working on uh, non quantum algorithms for almost 20 years now. Uh, in the beginning in Berkeley, then at MIT, and since more than 15 years now at CNRS in Paris. And since last year, I wanted really to understand more what are the real world applications of quantum of this very abstract thing that we have been studying for the last 20 years. So I started working with QCWare and I'm uh, heading the algorithms group. And I'm, uh, uh, we also opened our EU offices in Paris. So uh, this is what I will be discussing and I will be sharing my screen and hopefully everything will magically work. All right, I think we are ready. Okay, so I was very excited with Alexandre's talk because uh, I think he, he discussed uh, exactly how the hardware is trying to get better, to get better qubits and uh, more qubits uh, so that we can actually reach this point of real impact, this point of really having the first quantum uh, applications. And this is what all the hardware manufacturers are doing, but also people at the universities who are still doing some amazing experiments on how to get better qubits. But what I will be talking about today is more about a different way, which I think it's uh, equally uh, important to reach these quantum applications. And the way to do that is also figure out how to take the quantum algorithms and you know all these quantum tools that we know that they're very impactful and can uh, be used for many use cases, how to take this algorithm and actually make them work with much fewer resources and with a better performance. So I think it's very important that we work from both sides, how to make more and better qubits, but also how to get the best out of the qubits that we actually have. And uh, I think Alexandra said it as well. It's very important that we, we all talk to each other because this is, I think, the only way we can reach the, the real point of having quantum applications the fastest, as fast as possible. So a few words about uh, QCWare, and then I will pass more on the more uh, scientific part of my talk, which is about quantum machine learning. So we are basically a company that uh, started almost more than five years ago in uh, Palo Alto in uh, Silicon Valley. And uh, we opened our uh, offices in Paris last year. Uh, we make software because what we actually do is uh, we are coming from the computer science part of uh, the quantum science. We're offering services to companies that want to understand what these uh, quantum technologies can do for, for their sector. And we also uh, organize uh, one of the main events, uh, which is called Q2B, uh, Quantum to Business. It's a conference that happens every December. Uh, unfortunately, I think the next one will be a virtual one, which, you know, it will be a challenge, but it will still be great. And what I really want to focus on on my talk is the, the unique capability that we have on designing quantum algorithms. So really the group is mostly, uh, there is a large uh, part of the company that have been uh, working on quantum algorithms for quite some time. And this is what I will try to convey uh, to you, how we take our experience and our expertise on quantum algorithms and try to really use it for practical uh, use cases. And we'll see what we can do. As I said, we are in Palo Alto, we are in Paris. We were planning to open in uh, Tokyo sometime this year, but it's not very clear what will happen, but we will be in Asia uh, hopefully soon. And I will talk now more about designing quantum algorithms. So I will focus uh, mostly on machine learning, but I wanted to, to give you a little bit of an overview of what are the areas where we think that quantum computing can actually provide the applications. And this has to do with chemistry simulation, chemistry and physics simulation, optimization problems, uh, Monte Carlo methods, machine learning and differential equations. And I put them in this kind of sort of quite arbitrary timeline between near term and medium term and longer term. But the whole point of what we're trying to do is actually shift this, uh, these boxes there more to the left, like make them as, as, as near as possible. So here are a few words about optimization. So there are two types of optimization that quantum can actually offer advantages. So on one hand, we have combinatorial optimization. These are kind of your, your favorite NP-complete problems like the traveling salesman's 
problem or, or uh, max cut or satisfiability or graph coloring. So all these type of problems where you have variables that you have to assign a discrete value. You want to know if you will, uh, if your track should go first uh, to A and then to B or first to CTB and then to CTA, right? So the algorithms that people use and the heuristics that people use in the quantum world to, to work with this type of problems are what you probably know is it's quantum annealing, which this is what, uh, for example, D-Wave as a company is offering. And uh, D-Wave inherently can solve a very specific type of optimization. So a lot of work actually goes into taking your real application and mapping it into a way that it can be um, run on, on a D-Wave or a different annealing uh, machine. And the second type of techniques are what we call the QAOA type techniques, where uh, there you can also use them in the circuit model. And these are kind of uh, heuristics that try to use uh, the quantum effects of uh, tunneling in order to do some sort of quantum version of simulated annealing and try to find uh, better solutions faster somehow and avoid some sort of local minima that may provide you with solutions which are not very good. The second part of optimization has to do with convex optimization. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. These are problems that arise very often in practice. They have to do with linear programming, semi-definite programming. Uh, if you know the CPLEX, the, this is kind of uh, a, a library that people use to actually solve this type of problems. And this is also where we have done a lot of work. And what goes into this type of algorithms here is more about linear algebra. So this is also one thing that I want to, to, to mention, uh, that one of the things that we know that a big quantum computer can do very fast are things that have to do with linear algebra. Things about finding the eigenvalues of a matrix or doing some operation that depends on the eigenvalues and the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors of the matrix and things like that. And this is exactly the type of techniques that people have used starting from HHL, from Harrow, Hasidim and Lloyd to, to provide quantum algorithms for, for linear systems. So I'm putting this linear system solver as part of this quite uh, easy or complicated linear algebraic uh, techniques because it has to do with inverting a matrix. So this type of uh, quantum algorithms are very powerful, but they are not uh, algorithms that one can readily uh, use the 53 qubits that we have today to actually run them, okay? But here is something, for example, I want to make a point that there is, um, there is something which is very important and uh, which is the hardware, right? If you use better hardware, then obviously you can do more stuff. But the other important thing is that I think at some point we will all have access to the same hardware, the same way that you know, companies can go to AWS or Google Cloud or Azure and say, I want a cluster of GPUs, right? The question is, what do you run on this cluster of GPUs? And I think this is where the competitive advantage comes into, like what type of algorithms you're actually running when you're using this, the, the same hardware. And here is, for example, one slide that shows on how to use uh, the D-Wave machine to solve an optimization problem. And this works very well when you have very small problem sizes. So you can see that you can find good solutions quite often. But the moment that the problem size starts to be a little bit uh, larger, then you see how fast um, using the, the hardware directly with the, with, with, with the software that comes together with the hardware, how drastically um, these good solutions uh, fall. On the other hand, uh, if you use some of the algorithms, algorithmic tools and software that we have developed to work on top of the hardware, then we can see that we can make uh, much larger problems work than the ones that were possible before. So again, I want to make the point here that designing algorithms and, and writing optimized software is something extremely uh, important. And I think it's one of the key elements that will make us uh, reach uh, the applications of quantum computing as fast as possible. So the other area, as I said, is chemistry simulation. I am not a quantum chemist, so I am not going to spend a lot of time here. Apart from giving, again, another example, this is a very complicated molecule that, to be honest, I have no idea what 
what it is. But what we can see is that there are thousands of degrees of freedom, thousands of electrons, for example, in this in this uh, in this molecule. So if you naively try to say that okay, I'm going to use what people do, use one qubit for every electron, then you just give up because you don't have enough qubits, right? But as I said, if you really think about the problem more, what you can come up with is ways to figure out exactly what part of the problem you need to use a quantum computer for and what part you can very easily continue to use your classical uh, CPUs or GPUs or HPC machine. And then you can come up with ideas that can reduce the, the real number of qubits that, that you need to solve something as complicated as this molecule to something which is within reach even more, you know, uh, current uh, number of qubits uh, for for for, uh, for solving this problem. Let me very briefly tell you about tell you about one other uh, application. It's it's completely different now. We're talking about uh, Monte Carlo methods. So Monte Carlo methods are methods that are predominantly used in finance, but also in other uh, sectors. And the main idea here, for example, the problem that you want to solve is how do you price some, some option, right? And what you need to do in the mathematical problem that you need to solve is that you have, uh, you have a function and you want to figure out what is the expected value of this function when you draw inputs to the function according to some distribution, okay? So we did some work already with Goldman Sachs on these Monte Carlo methods, and let me be a little bit more precise. So there is a very important quantum tool that we kind of all know, which is basically based on, on Grover's search, which is called amplitude estimation. And amplitude estimation is exactly the, the quantum tool that we can use to estimate this expectation of this function that is interesting uh, uh, for these Monte Carlo methods, right? So what we can get is that what we know is that if we have a big, fault tolerant quantum computer, then we can get a large advantage compared to classical Monte Carlo methods. And the advantage is this factor of one over epsilon compared to one over epsilon square in the classical case. But if we want to be more, you know, a little bit more practical, the, the advantage for, for values of epsilon that make sense, let's say that you can, you can solve your Monte Carlo problem 2000 times faster than in your classical computer. Again, I'm talking about steps of the algorithm. I'm not getting into the clock speeds and all these things. Again, I'm, what I said is that you have a very good quantum computer for now, right? But in order to get this 2000 factor uh, improvement in the speed, you do need to have a quantum computer whose depth actually grows as 2000. So you need a very, very deep quantum machine, which means that you need to have very, very good quality qubits, right? So the question is, what can you do? So either you say, I have to wait until I get hardware that can actually uh, work correctly for a very big depth, because this is what I need for my uh, applications. Or you can say, can I actually go back to the draw board and figure out new ways of doing these Monte Carlo methods, which are more NISC amenable, as I want to call them, right? And what we did and what we're continuing to do is be, figure out exactly what is the optimal trade-off between the hardware that you have, in particular, the depth of the quantum circuit that you can run, and how much advantage can you get compared to the classical methods, right? And what we, you can come up with, and this is actually what we came up with, is that, for example, even if you have a quantum circuit of depth 30, and now we went from 2000 to 30, you can still get a factor of 1000 faster than the classical machine. So we went from 2000 to 1000. Okay, we lost a factor of two, but we reduced the depth from 2000 to something that it's maybe not today possible, but you know, the Google experiment had depth 14 or 15. We are asking for something like depth 30 or 50. So as we can see, it is much closer to what we would call uh, a near term application of of quantum technologies. So let me go into the main uh, part of my talk, which has to do with quantum machine learning. This is the area that I have been working on in the last uh, few years. Um, we have published a lot. Uh, this is due to the fact that I have many amazing students in Paris. Um, the last, uh, the first three papers are the ones that have been published in the uh, top machine learning uh, conferences, ICLR, ICML, and NeurIPS. And what I will try to do is, is try to tell you how these quantum algorithms that are, again, 
uh, more theoretical in nature, assume that you can do things like loading quantum data or having a long enough quantum uh, circuit, how within QCWare, what we try to do is figure out ways of making them closer to NISC without losing much of the impact and of the advantage that these algorithms can provide. So here's what we want to do in quantum machine learning. And I also want to add that this is a project which is also, uh, we have received the help from BPI France through a Concours d'Innovation. So we're very happy and very proud of that. So what we want to do is we want to figure out ways of having very good performance by having the small hardware requirement, okay? So this is not very easy to, to do, right? One way of trying to do it is to start using heuristics. You say that, okay, I can only use 16 qubits and depth three. So I'm going to come up with something that uses exactly that and you know, cross my fingers and pray that the miracle will happen. It's not so easy to make heuristics work, especially when you, know, you, you start with the hardware and then you try to find the heuristics that fit the hardware. The other way that one can try to actually go towards this ideal target is to use the quantum machine learning algorithms that we already know. They're extremely performant and powerful, but they need a lot of hardware requirements. And what we really try to do is to move both these, these ends towards a more realistic target, which would also give us good performance and the requirement of the hardware will not be excessive. And the way we try to do it is, as I said, is by reducing the resources of the QML algorithms, try to get rid of how many qubits and how much depth we need for these quantum algorithms. And by pushing uh, what it means to be MISC to meet the algorithmic needs. And this is quite interesting because many times, if you know what you want to, to, to use your machine to, to solve, then you can come up with slightly different ways of, of the architecture of the machine that could be extremely useful for you, but maybe the hardware people have not thought about it because they don't necessarily know everything that someone would want to do with this machine. So once again, it's very important to have this dialogue between what kind of hardware we're, we're making and where and how we want to use this, this hardware. So, why quantum machine learning? So machine learning is kind of everywhere and it's becoming more and more important in many different sectors, right? So I think quantum is one uh, case that can help this field. And this is a field with extremely important applications. So we should be very careful and try to understand what quantum can do for machine learning. And the other important aspect is that we do know that if we had as good computers as quantum computers as we want, then we could offer uh, big advantages. And this is kind of the work that we have been doing uh, in the last few years. But what I want to show you now is that we also have some concrete avenues of bringing these quantum machine learning algorithms towards more uh, NISC type machines. And with NISC type machines, I don't necessarily mean non-error corrected machines. They could also be small error corrected machines, even better or uh, quantum machines which where we would only need a circuit with very small depth so that the qubits may not have to be error corrected but they will still be correct because we are you know we are running it for a very short time uh, i will not talk more about another aspect of machine learning that has to do with deep learning with neural networks and how we can use variational quantum uh, circuits uh, as ideas on how to construct uh, neural networks. But I want to say that another important thing is that there are many different things that one can want when trying to do quantum machine learning. We may want to be faster, we may want to be more accurate, but there are also other very important uh, properties like, for example, interpretability, trustworthiness. What do I mean with that? I, we want to make sure that our machine learning algorithms do not have biases. We want to make sure that someone can explain why the algorithm took this decision and why not another decision. And maybe this is not very clear or important when you have to tell cats from dogs, but it's extremely important when you use this in uh, sectors like uh, the automotive or aerospace or the military or finance. We do need to be able to justify our decisions. And this is something where quantum can also help. So I think I have maybe 
five minutes, uh, actually maybe a little more. Okay, so let me try now to, to go a little bit more in detail on what are the quantum machine learning features that we needed before we can actually provide some, some applications, okay? So the first bottleneck that we had to deal with is how do we uh, load classical data into these quantum machines? Because many of these quantum algorithms need the data to be in some sort of quantum format, let's say like that. And why do we need to do that? Because all of the data that we have today is really classical. And maybe in the future, we will also have some quantum data, but I really believe that the vast majority of data that we have around us is classical and we have to deal with the fact that we have classical data, right? So we need to figure out a way to efficiently load classical data into quantum states that make sense for the quantum algorithms and can provide uh, the, the advantages that we need. So maybe you have heard about all these kind of uh, suggestions about doing uh, what people call this QRAM, which is kind of the let's say a quantum analog of the classical RAM that your computer has. But if you look a little bit at these uh, suggestions and these um, ways of building QRAM, you come up with some ideas which are extremely difficult to grasp and certainly not something that looks like we can do now or in the very near future, right? So what we had to do is figure out exactly what is it that we need from our quantum data loaders and figure out ways of doing this with the current hardware technology that we have. So we don't want to, 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 um, to imagine that we have hardware that we don't, right? We want to push the NISC hardware to become better and we want to be able to have QML applications. So we needed to find ways of loading classical data in quantum uh, states. And this is, for example, some characteristics of how do you load a 64 feature uh, data point. So you have a data point, it has 64 features. How many qubits do you need in order, let's say real values, how many qubits or how much depth or how many gates do you need in order to do something like that? You can have a very parallel version. You use exactly 64 qubits and you only have circuit depth seven, or you can reduce the qubits to 16 and increase a little bit the number of gates to 72. So we know exactly what are the optimal trade-offs between how many qubits you need to use, how much depth of the quantum circuits you need to use in order to be able to load your classical data into quantum states. So this was the first thing that we needed to do because then what we can do is that we can start doing things that are important for machine learning. And one of them is check the similarity between your data. So you have all this data, it can be images, it can be text, it can be any type of points. One of the main ways of figuring out how to classify your inputs or how to uh, cluster your inputs is by having fast and efficient ways of checking whether your inputs are close to each other or far from each other. So this is what we call distance estimation um, procedures, which are the core of the similarity learning. And what I like about the similarity learning is, is, uh, is that it's, uh, it's one of the explainable ways of doing artificial intelligence, okay? So what we had to do is use our loaders and say, okay, there's no point in loading classical data into quantum states if you cannot use what you come out, what you get out of these loaders to do something fast and efficiently, right? And the first thing we wanted to do is this distance estimation, which is exactly what we can do. And here is some more data. If you have now two vectors of 16 dimensions, the number of qubits that you need in order to get a very, very good estimate on the distance between these two qubits on the third decimal point, for example, is 17 qubits. Actually, we can even do it with 16 qubits and 13 depth. Again, maybe not today, but certainly not very far from tomorrow. These things can be uh, implemented. 16 dimensional data is not necessarily the data that you need. You might need to have a thousand dimensional data. So you will need a thousand qubits. Again, we are not talking about millions and millions of qubits. We are trying our best and, you know, there's no free lunch. You have to pay on, on the number of qubits that you do. So very briefly, uh, in the next three minutes that I have, I think, two? All right, in the next two and a half minutes, uh, where, do you, where do we use this, this distance estimation? One of the simple things we can do is classify points. How do we classify points? 
instead of classically computing distances between points, which is where most of the time is spent in classical machine learning, in training your models and stuff, we can do this quantumly, we can do it faster. And not only that, but we can actually write down the codes, make the quantum circuits, measure things that come out from the quantum circuits. And you can see now that we get the correct labels for something like quantum near the centroid, and we can benchmark our techniques against the, some of the best classical techniques that are out there. It's, we are using scikit-learn, which is actually based in France, and it's one of the most popular libraries that people use for machine learning. We can do the same about regression. You can see, if you don't see the difference between these two uh, graphs, it's because there's not much difference between the quantum and the classical case. And we can also do clustering, which is even more uh, involved. As you can see here from the results, we don't get exactly the same results because there is a randomness and there is noise in the results, but we do get good clustering uh, algorithms. So I think I'm going to end in the next minute. I just wanted to go back on uh, how do we work with companies because I think it's also very important. It, it's important for the algorithms people to work with hardware people. It's also very important to work with the real users, the, 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 the users that will have the, the, the problems that they have to solve in their everyday you know, uh, life. And we collaborate a lot with different uh, industry. I'm not gonna go through all of these. There are more, there are more companies that we do right now, also in France. We will be able to announce these things a little later on. Oil and gas, energy, finance. Uh, these are the sectors that have, have started to embrace uh, quantum computing. We uh, provide three different types of services. A two-day workshop where there is one bottom line figure out what are the best use cases in your sector that are amenable to quantum advantages. So we can start working on them through a standard project or an advanced project where we take the use case, we use algorithms, quantum algorithms. This is the, what we know how to do. We write software, we execute on hardware, some small part of the, of the algorithm, and we come up with the resource analysis on when should you expect quantum computing to, to impact your industry. So I'm gonna skip all of these slides. I think the slides are made available, so this is great. And I think the last slide I have is about our product. We also create software. This is our Forge platform. And our Forge platform, what we think is will sit on top of your cloud providers that will give you access to the quantum hardware. You have the hardware, you have the cloud providers that will give you access to this hardware where we're sitting is on top of that to offer the most optimized and performant software in order to get the most you can out of the quantum processing units that you will have access to in the near future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ordanis. Uh, well, no worries for uh, all the attendees. The slides that was passed by pretty quickly are available. I can confirm it. So you will have the opportunity to dig into them and uh, send a lot of mail to your Dennis to know much more, to have much more detail on them. Uh, I wanted to thank you very much, your Dennis. Uh, the uh, duality between your uh, startup role and the uh, researcher uh, is very valuable to us and uh, was is very exciting, especially uh, the fact that uh, the software and algorithmic side is working in parallel with the hardware to improve what we can do on the same hardware and this, um, this parallel progresses are uh, very exciting for uh, us at Le Lab Quantique, bringing application in, at the nearest term than what we thought was possible uh, some years ago. So congratulations and thank you very much. Thank you again. Now let me introduce you to Jean-Christophe Eloi, leading your development, who just uh, published a very interesting study on quantum technologies and how they will impact a lot of markets. Uh, we all have a focus on quantum communication market, and now it's your time, uh, Jean-Christophe. Thank you very much for joining also. Oh, I'm afraid you're still uh, on mute mode. Is it better like that? Yeah, works fine. Okay. I hope you can see my screen. Yes, everything works fine. Okay, so thank you. So um, 
I'm Jean-Christophe Elroy, and thank you for the opportunity to, uh, well, to present our analysis on these quantum technologies and to understand the industrial perspective and, and try to evaluate the, the market side. So um, uh, just a few words on, on your, we are market research, but also uh, technology and, and strategy consulting company involved in multiple fields linked to the semiconductor industry. And we start working on this quantum computing potential markets and existing markets several years ago, and we have just published so uh, one report on that few few weeks ago. And the data I will present is extracted from uh, from this report, and you will get access to the slide. So I will jump directly on the presentation. You have more data concerning uh, your and our activities in, in the presentation. And this is the the report we published so uh, beginning of this year. So if we're looking at this well, quantum technologies from the application perspective, so you have the, the computer parts in terms of quantum computers and also quantum annealers. We make the difference between the two because it's quite different in terms of what you are able to do with that. You have the sensors and the atomic clock that are on the market in well, significant time. And it's uh, today very important part of the total market. And you have the, the all the telecommunication application, especially these quantum key distribution systems and where a significant part of the market is expected to, 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 to grow and to, to start really um, be extremely active in the, from now and in the next months. Few slides, general, during slides, we'll move fast on that. Well, significant investment, both from the states uh, all over the world, but also from the companies. Um, the, the breakdown in terms of funds that has been invested is we are more than 1 billion at the moment up to date, and it's, well, still growing um, months after months. Benefit of quantum, well known on that, superposed states, the probabilistic systems, the entanglements, and this wave particle duality you can play with, which are used a lot. Um, and these properties are really the, the main uh, properties that are exploited for quantum computers, but also for the cryptography and the sensing part. Uh, well, qubit or not qubit, what does quantum uh, means? Um, you have different um, activities that are qubit based using so superposition of measurable values in computing for the entanglement, for the telecommunication. But also you have other applications that are not qubit based, but are using at least one of the following quantum effects in terms of uh, quantitized energy levels, the quantum coherence or the entanglement. And this is, for example, for sensors in atomic clocks. This is for gravimeters. French companies doing that in UCAS. But it's also all the, the squid, the magnetometers, the imager that are used, that are using that kind of uh, quantum technologies as part of the uh, key added value and the ability to deliver well measurement for the for the sensor level. So it's important to take that into account first because it's a business, existing business with cells and significant cells. It's also something that is supporting the overall quantum industry. So in the same way, I will not deep dive into the, the, the technology behind that, but if you are looking at the comparison of the qubit technologies, what we are trying also to look at is, of course, the number of physical qubits, because as mentioned in, in the two previous talk, physical qubits are really important to make the logical qubits, and you need multiple physical qubits to do that but also the fidelity, the coherence, and the scalability, how to be able to scale that, because you, you will need hundreds, thousands of, of physical qubits for a quantum computer, and to be able to have the scalability at the, the, the qubit level and the, the system level is really super important. And from our analysis, well, photonic qubits, quantum dots, uh, using in the spintronic category, are really the one where the scalability is the most important and where in the future, scalability can really be able to pave the way for this logical qubit. Uh, just a few words on this uh, logical qubit and physical qubits. Um, one single logical qubit is in the range of 1,000 physical qubits. Could be more, could be less. It's, it's just a, a level. Um, it clearly, strongly depends on the software. Uh, and if you are looking about a quantum computer, it's should be hundreds of logical qubits. That means hundreds of thousands of physical qubits. Today, so last year we had 53 qubits. So we need certainly 10, 20, 25 years 
before having a quantum computer, they can really make complex um, calculation and can run complex al algorithm. So it's clearly more than 10 years away. Does it mean that there is no market before that? But clearly, this capability to make very complex calculation will need these hundreds of logical cubics, which means hundreds of thousands of physical cubics. It's important to keep that in mind because there is a, a very strong impact, of course, of the market and the potential market growth in the next years. Just focus on the quantum computers uh, as, a, as a first step. So it's a lot of different players from the, the, the big Amazon, but also Intel, but also Honeywell, a uh, lot of different startups that are working on that significant investment in China, also around Huawei and multiple other things around that. And we can really try to characterize that with organizations that are focusing on quantum engineering, like D-Wave Fujitsu, which is here really optimization of problems. Quantum computers developed by multiple technologies. So the spin qubit, the quantum qubits, optics, the quantum optics, sorry, the trapped ion atoms, the, the topological qubits. Um, and uh, well, in between these superconducting qubits that are used both for the quantum annular and for the, the, the quantum computer. So the, the status of the development in the same way, it's something that is well known. We are in this range of, for the, the quantum computer, 53 qubits last year going up for the physical qubit, but still low compared to what is needed for a real quantum computer. And if you are looking at the the, the different elements of a quantum computer, where's the critical part and wh where is the, the value at the moment in terms of dollar value, not in the development level, but in the, in the market level. Clearly, the cryo technology is the critical building blocks for the quantum computer. This is really super highly technical. Few organizations are really mastering the level needed. And, and this is really where both the, 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 the ground for the extension of the quantum computer and the value is at the moment in terms of development. Um, applications is spreading across multiple industries, clearly, uh, but all these industries have to learn how to use a quantum computer, how to uh, make the, the, to do the algorithm on link to that. And there is a learning phase that is clearly that has started. And the, the two presentation before I've highlighted that, and it's super important. And it's paving the way also at multiple business models for quantum computing. So you have the quantum computing hardware, starting from the left, um, where we're talking about uh, lasers or, or, or modules, um, multiple structures that are the building blocks of quantum computer. Several companies that are working on the quantum computer, we already mentioned that from, so the way for the analog, but also Intel, it's Google, it's Microsoft and so on and so on. And then all the software and the application layer and the, the presentation just before me highlights very clearly the importance of this software. Um, you need uh, adaptation of language, uh, adaptation of methodologies in order to be able to use a quantum computer. And it's not something that will happen over the night. It's really something that has to be developed, learned, and where a lot of support is needed around that. So it's a very important part of the growth of the, the quantum computing. And this is the part that is clearly growing the most fastest in terms of value compared to the existing value of quantum computer. When I'm talking about value, it's really value in terms of market, um, commercial markets, not investment and R&D investment. And of course, off top of that, from the left, you have all the services, um, uh, which you can find multiple companies from Atos, Fujitsu, uh, multiple Chinese organization, IBM, and so on and so on. But there is a continuum here, um, and there is a super importance of each part of it, the software and the application layer being the one in the next five to 10 years that is driving certainly the largest level of uh, sales um, in, term of, uh, in term of activities. We have tried also to understand this quantum computer from the point of view of the wafers for the one that are relying on wafers to be processed. And it's something that is extremely small. We are talking about few wafers per year, it, it, it's, it's linked to the number of uh, qubits that we are able to integrate at the moment. And the scalability of that is extremely limited. So it's clearly not interested for a large foundry, it's more business for specialized foundries. And the, the value is not clearly not in that part of the hardware. 
let's move to cryptography. So uh, quantum cryptography relies on this exchange of public key between emitter and, and, and receiver. Uh, so well, well known on that. Um, what is here interesting is that uh, if you are looking at the players, you have here also a mix of uh, startup, very large companies specialize on cryptography um, and uh, spread that are in terms of application that are coming from pure financial organization, defense organization, but also consumer market. And multiple companies here are involved from the, the generation generator of random number key. Uh, ID Quantique being one of the one, and I will come back on uh, an announcement I've done, I think one week ago, two weeks ago. You have the quantum key distribution by fiber optics, other type of companies, and you have the public key distribution that can resist the, the short algorithm, other type of companies around that. If you're looking at the market last year, for, for that, so you have only few players that are sharing that market. It was roughly $68 million from one analysis. So you have Quasky, Quantum C Tech, ID, uh, Quantic, and few others that are sharing that market. Nobody has more than 15% of that market. And I will show you the expected growth a little bit later. It, it's quite significant. So it's already a business. And what was interesting, I think it was two weeks ago, that ID Quantic mentioned that uh, they have launched with SK. SK Telecom in, in uh, Korea, the first world first 5G smone equipped with a quantum random generator, number generator with a chipset. And well, it took 20 years for ID Quantic to reduce this, the random key generator from a shoebox to really a chip. It's a two by two mid square millimeter chip, which is quite in incredible. So the, this mobile phone will be available within, I think, three weeks in Korea. We are trying to get them in order to, to be able to make the reverse engineering on that, to understand the way it's done. But it's really today for real. It's a, it's a specialized Samsung phone that has been turned to this, using this ID Quantic chip from SK Telecom. And uh, they are really testing the market um, to understand what could be the mainstream applications linked to this telecommunication and its cryptography on, on that. So it's very interesting initiative. And it's really these quantum technologies that are popping up in a real life. Um, and it's, I think, quite important to mention and, and see what will happen after that. When we are talking about quantum sensors, it's, it's squid arrays, is on chip atomic axiometers uh, that are under developments. Um, and most of the market at the moment is really on squids and, 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 and atomic clocks. Uh, multiple companies are working on that. It's a significant market. I will show that a little bit later. And we are talking about big systems or small systems. And just the example of Mucans that has been able to, uh, to make a quantum gravimeter, which is measuring in very high precision, super high precision, the Hertz gravity. Um, and, and this is for geophysics and geodesy. This is for subsurface analysis, for oil prospections, for archaeology, bunker detections, earthquake, and of course, for on the purpose. And it's a market, it's a market of few units, few tens of units per year, but it's a significant market in number of size just because it's rather expensive. For looking at the, the forecast, which is the, I think the part which is important to look at more in details. We are just counting in our forecast, the possible revenue generated by quantum computing um, hardware and also the software part. Not, of course, the revenues that can be generated by the compute, quantum computing calculation. So the forecast is based on the estimation of sales of the, the players that are indicated here, which are the, the most advanced. And for the, the, the software part, we do not include the possible future market value of the software market that could be used by any user who should who would do their own um, for their own compute, uh, computer programming. It's really the, the, so the quantum computing as a service that is forecasted here. And you see that the, the, the market for this quantum computing hardware, last year we were talking about 30, 35 million dollars. Uh, this year, 45, so very strong growth, 50% growth, but still uh, low level uh, market, just because we are talking about the commercial market on that and growing step by step to reach uh, uh, in 2030, uh, 650 million. So, the, the value here is limited, uh, just because, as I mentioned before, the, having a quantum computer will take several tens of years, certainly, 
uh, before having a machine that is really able to provide its full potential. But what is interesting is this first evaluation of uh, this quantum computing as a service, where it, it will be just nascent at the moment with estimations that it's few million dollars um, this year. Maybe it will be a little bit higher uh, because of the lot of initiative around that. But we're here not, we are not talking about the R&D uh, work based on that is really the, the commercial market and moving to in the range of 1.3, 1.4 billion in 2030. So what is important here is that the growth of this uh, quantum as a service, quantum computing as a service is much faster compared to the, the quantum computing hardware. And one of the reasons that the, the, the ability to understand the way quantum computer is working, to, to try it, to, to make few developments on that and using the software, available software to do so, are key elements for the growth of the hardware side. So this is the, the estimation we have done. But if you are looking at all the applications, so from 2020 to 2025 to 2030, um, the, the, the starting with the, the biggest part, the quantum sensing, which is blue in the presentation. So we are moving to a market which, which will move from $414 million this year. So within 10 years to $545 million. So it's a significant market, slow growth, but well-established business. Uh, and a significant number of companies are already doing sales on that. For the cryptography part, so we are estimating the market this year at $84 million, um, moving to more than $200 million in 2025, moving to almost $800 million in 2030. The test of ID Quantic with Samsung under the SK Telecom umbrella will ski this year to see uh, what will be the, the reaction of the market on that, will be, who will be using that, um, and could clearly change the, the forecast. But we are in a very strong growth path because we are talking about a market multiplied by 10 in the next 10 years. And on top of that, you have the quantum computing. So 33 million uh, for this year, moving to 240 in 2025 and 1.9 if you're counting both the software and the hardware, reaching almost $2 billion in 2030. So um, as mentioned earlier, time is needed in order to be able to have enough qubits to do logical qubits in order to be able to build a quantum computer. And clearly the growth will, will be much faster after 2030. What is here very important to understand is that the, what is behind that is that a lot of companies, universities, organizations in general um, will start to play with quantum computers and, and play with them through um, software interface, not by buying systems, just through this interface. And this is really the part that is extremely needed in order to find the applications and find the business case that can drive the growth of the, co the quantum computer hardware. And this is the one that can really adapt the use of that. If you are looking at the, the different uh, player ma mapping and what they are doing, so you have the, the, the sensor and methodology in terms of companies. You have the cryo systems that are working across the multiple applications. You have the single photon um, providers, the module providers. You have the photonic IC providers, the photon detectors uh, providers. You have the, the so the, the two organization, the two type of organization that are working on cryptography, either for the, the number generation or for the communication. Then the software that are working across the multiple application and the, the, the quantum computer. A lot of different companies that are most, most of them are specialized on one type of development. So beyond systems, uh, quantum uh, is attracting really many other players in crypto technology, in services, in software, and so on. And this is really the, the, the black box that is behind the announcements of the Intel, the Microsoft of, of the world, or the Google of the world all the companies that are providing these crypto technologies, the services, the, the key elements in order to be able to build the first uh, quantum computers and the, the, the technology behind that. And companies are very important, very numerous. As I said, mix of startup and, and, and big companies, but the growth and the importance of the knowledge behind that is really very significant and it's a, it's a very important growth behind that. Okay, so just, few conclusions um, before so providing 
you the, 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 the screen back. We, we are really entering this second quantum revolution where engineering is needed to develop future quantum systems because the, the building blocks are, are here, the, the, the key elements for of coming from the, the science are here. Now creating a quantum computer, creating further developments, using further developments in order to be able to build sensors or to use this quantum cryptography for the day-to-day -day lives. Um, it's, it's clearly an engineering problem. A lot of R&D is needed, but there is a, a lot to be done in order to be have a real disruption compared to the tra traditional semiconductor supply chain in terms of new physical principles for that. It's really something that is hyper important in order to be able to understand, to, to have the building blocks on the engineering level to scale quantum computers, uh, quantum sensors, or the, the, the cryptography behind that. Uh, and what is super interesting is that, well, a lot of small companies are involved in this quantum revolution and find interesting opportunities. So we are always talking about the, the Google, Microsoft, Intel, the announcements and so on and so on. But the companies that are doing the business at the moment and taking benefit of that, as I'm mentioning, it's cryogenic uh, companies that are providing cryogenic uh, technologies. This is companies that are providing software that are helping users to try what is available in terms of quantum computers. And it's clearly this part of the market that is really growing at the moment, not of course the quantum computer part, but really this part of the market that is growing. And it is really super interesting because this is the, the heart of the, of the revolution. So this is the end of my presentation. And uh, well, uh, we'll take the time later to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jean-Christophe. It was uh, really passionate. You did a great job on uh, this analysis. Because there are uh, some studies uh, by other consulting groups, uh, which are saying roughly uh, the same, so we can uh, be sure that uh, um, the future is great for quantum technologies, especially on the growth rate side. I also think that um, you, you might not have mentioned the fact that uh, by calculating the potential productivity gains offered by quantum computing, we should also pump those numbers up and achieve some very interesting uh, profit for a big corporate that will use uh, quantum computers. Clearly. Uh, so thank you very much uh, to uh, all uh, these crazy panelists and Christophe also for organizing all uh, this event. Uh, we, uh, I have um, uh, loaded the Q&A, so uh, we'll share it with you if you need it. Do not hesitate to send us a mail. It was uh, very cool to have you, and uh, was, uh, you had uh, very, very interesting speeches. We'll share it also on uh, our website, and we'll replace uh, the YouTube. Thank you very much to uh, all of you. Thank you for organizing. Thank Goodbye. Thank you for the invitation for organizing. Goodbye. Thank you.